Welcome to Citizens Forum. My name is Walter McGinnis. Uh, today I have with me uh, Dermot Travis from Integrity BC and Dermot has agreed to come here today <laughs> and try to explain to us connection between uh, illegal gambling, or not illegal gambling, but, but illegal criminal activities, um, drug profits, uh, casino gambling, and of course, high house prices and how these things are all related. So welcome to the show today, Dermot. Thank you. So let's start <laughs> the story out. I mean, how, is, how does it happen that uh, illegal, illegal drug activity can drive up house prices? <laughs> well, how does that work? You really have to go back to 2002. And I know that'll surprise a few listeners, but in 2002, the new government of the day under Gordon Campbell decided to uh, completely overhaul how gambling was overseen in the province. Now, prior to that point, there were seven different bodies in the government that had oversight of various activities within the gaming world, whether it's horse racing, cards, bingo, etc. After the overhaul, there was only three, and one of them directly out of the ministry. So you didn't have public appointees to the same level on those oversight boards to sort of act as a public advocate. Right. Uh, by 2005, things had started to bubble a bit. Yeah. People had heard things. And so the Auditor General uh, decided to do a review of BC's oversight of the gaming industry. And the government, to be fair, didn't come out with such a bad review. Uh, but the Auditor General highlighted a few points of concern, which included uh, the fact we were now reduced to three oversight bodies and that their oversight practices didn't seem to really hold up to close scrutiny. So there was no real improvement, perhaps some decline in their abilities. Some decline and, and even more decline about to happen. Now, back in 2002, the Solicitor General who brought in uh, this package was Rich Coleman, who many people will be familiar with. Uh, 2005, he's still responsible for oversight of the gaming industry. He's also responsible for oversight of the gaming industry in 2010. And that's another important marker because that's when he decided to do away with the joint task force on gaming enforcement in the province between the RCMP and the BC government's authority. So how long is this task force? How long was it in uh, It operating? had been pretty well in place up until that point. Yeah. Uh, for all the years that we've had gaming okay. going on. A and their job is to work together to make certain that criminal elements who are generally attracted to casinos, but for the wrong reasons, uh, don't in fact take root. Uh, now, principal reason, criminal elements like casinos, is it's a great way to wash money and to wash a lot of money fast uh, and to do it at a fairly low cost compared to other options. And so after 2010, suddenly hmm, criminals are looking around, not much oversight going on. And the amount of money that was getting laundered was growing and growing. Was it be, and this is kind of an international thing, isn't it? It, it became known internationally as the Vancouver model. Yeah. And it was, I believe, a professor in New Zealand or Australia who coined that phrase. Uh, and, and it's a very unique model. I'll, I'll come to that in a sec. But yeah. you know, let's just go back to the uh, going in to clean loads of money fast issue. Yeah. Is it, other provinces didn't have this particular problem uh, to the same degree. In some provinces, they have very little money laundering going through their casinos because they're government owned and operated. Yeah. BC doesn't have that. It's like Ontario. Okay. Uh, g government oversight, but not government operated. And so these elements, they're looking around, and suddenly River Rock Casino, which was identified uh, earlier this summer in Peter German's report on money laundering in BC called Dirty Money, uh, Royal River Rock Casino was identified as the epicenter of the money laundering problem in British Columbia, mm -hmm. and that it reached its apex in 2015. Now, what does that mean? That means somebody walking in with $3 million in $20 bills having them counted and being given chips and being allowed to gamble and being allowed to cash out and nobody asking any really hard questions. And it was at that point <coughs> that I think the former government finally kind of caught on they might have a problem. That problem, however, goes back again to post-2010 because you had reporters from CBC and CTV 
going into casinos in British Columbia, laundering money for investigative features <laughs> and getting away with it in most cases. Uh, even the federal government was upset with BC. Now, at 2013, uh, 2011 cabinet shuffle, Rich Coleman was sort of shuffled out for the lotteries and Mike de Jong was shuffled in for the lotteries uh, and he took over oversight. But frankly, it hasn't been until this summer that we've actually seen a government who wants to take clear action to cut it, to stop it. Yeah. How does it relate to house prices? Yeah, I mean, this is the yeah. thing is that, well, how much, in, how much would you say per year this activity is worth? How many millions of dollars? Does anybody know? I don't think anybody has a good handle. I think about $100 million was okay. being laundered annually through okay. casinos, so gambling operations, some of which were illegal, by the way. I yeah. remember you saying that in your intro. Um, and taking place very close to River Rock. But what you had in Vancouver was a situation where not only could you buy a house where your bank would send the seller a check for their mortgage, etc. Yeah. You could buy it for cash. And wow. I remember uh, being in an anti-corruption conference about two years ago where a police officer from the Vancouver Forest talked about the fact that they knew that there were cars in Vancouver that were often driving around the city with a million dollars in cash in them. And they were doing that because they had nowhere else that they could really put it safely. So they put it in a car and drove it around. Uh, Kathy Tomlinson did a great report in the Globe and Mail on that and how it links to fentanyl. And then how fentanyl links to the real estate prices because that too became a process for how to launder the profits. Of so the, the, sale, the sale of fentanyl, which was, is associated with heroin also, a lot of people looking for fentanyl were heroin addicts. Yeah, cocaine as well. So we have this group that are really fueling the drug addiction industry and now taking their profits and, and laundering them through the casinos to buy real estate. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they didn't even have to launder it through the casinos. Yeah. Uh, it was cash. There it was. Uh, and I know in Kathy Tomlinson's article that um, uh, she talked about the RCMP, I believe, pulling one car over just outside of Merritt. Uh, and it was about $600,000 in cash with fentanyl and cocaine residue on some of the bills. Um, but there's nothing illegal about having $600,000 of cash in your car. You don't car. have to explain where that came well, you, from. Well, you might have to explain, and you better have a really good reason. That's where you could yeah. get into a problem. But simply driving around with $600,000 is not against the criminal code. So, I mean, uh, Rich Coleman uh, is no longer in the government. Uh, uh, the so He's still in the legislature. That's true. And Those days are being counted. Yeah, <laughs> and I was going to say the so-called, I mean, the liberals aren't that far from power, really, uh, a couple of seats in their, in their back end. So uh, do you think that the NDP really has the, let's say, the motivation that's required to really clean this up? Well, I think uh, the, the government has to do something very important, and that is they have to call a public inquiry. Okay. Uh, there was news earlier today uh, about Peter German uh, who authored the Dirty Money Report, denying that he had a conflict of interest in regards to the board that he sits on with someone else from a gaming authority. Yeah. And the problem we run into in British Columbia with all of these types of reports is that somebody always finds something that could draw someone into question and therefore they toss it out there. Yeah. The only way you can really get to the bottom of this is a public inquiry where people has, have to testify in public under oath where they have lawyers and can be cross-examined. Yeah. Rich Coleman was on CKNW in, I believe it was June, he was asked if the government's uh, gambling policies were somehow influenced by gaming donations to the okay. BC Liberal Party. A and he denied that you know, casinos ever gave money to the BC Liberals. He even talked about it being in their constitution. Now, he began to walk it back a bit, but certainly never came out to say he did, except or the party did, well, the big two gaming players in British Columbia since 2015, Apex, remember, yeah. uh, have donated each more than $100,000 to the B.C. Liberal well, that's Party. That's interesting. But what I find so incredible is that Rich Coleman could say that yeah. when he had all of three checks to his own re-election campaign in 2017, 
one from somebody in the construction industry, another from Super Save Shred, Shredding, and another from Gateway Casinos. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he, Gateway Casinos was the only candidate in all of British Columbia and all of the parties that they decided to give a check directly to that person's campaign. Um, he I seem to have slipped his mind, or I, I, you know, he, he's been in government <laughs> a long time. Might have a lot to remember. And might not always come back as fast. <laughs> but what I think is most incredible that didn't come back as fast are those photos of him at BC Liberal Party fundraising events with the vice president of Great Canadian Gaming, uh -huh. Chuck Keeling, and not only at BC Liberal Party fundraising events, but at non BC Liberal Party events, yeah. golf tournaments. To suggest that they were somehow strangers in the night, I'm sorry. So These two knew each other well and is very clear when you look at social media between them. It's not illegal then. I mean, just to be clear, it's not illegal to go into a casino with a, with a, with a suitcase full of cash right now, uh, you know, and, and uh, buy a bunch of chips and then cash those chips out. Well, that is illegal if you are laundering money. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's your money... And you can prove that it's your money. Uh, that is not. But illegal. they're not. Are they asking questions or not at this well, moment? Well, they are supposed to be asking questions, yeah. and there's always been a federal policy in place. Yeah. Uh, FinTrack, which oversees uh, that for the federal government, actually fined, I, I believe, the BC Lottery Corporation about six hundred thousand dollars in around 2012, and is the only provincial gambling authority to have ever been fined. Uh, for failing to get reports in, etc. Uh, the government, uh, not the government, the BC Lottery Corporation decided to purchase a software uh, that was sold to them on the basis of being able to speed up all of this work. It was supposed to be in operation, I think, four years ago, and they're still waiting for it today okay. to be up and running. So, I mean, this is a, what the hope is. I mean, it sounds very shady. Most people are going to be thinking about this situation particularly with the crisis we're having with uh, the fentanyl crisis that it's killing 100 people a month still in Brit British Columbia. The rates of death have stayed that way for the last three or four years. Um, there's a lot of money to be made in, in, in drug running. And to fi find a situation here where they're really associating themselves with the, the people that are selling these drugs. And they don't seem to have a strong interest in cleaning it up. I'm hoping the NDP and the, the new Attorney General, is he a Solicitor General or Attorney General? Uh, he's Attorney General. The Attorney General. Uh, Mike Farnworth is Solicitor General. And, and uh, you know, it, it seems to me there should be no mystery in this. It seems to be quite simple to monitor this. You know, you could send an agent into the casino and just stand beside the wicket where they do the business. I mean, it's, it's right out there in the open. And, and, and to think that that's complicated is, to me, is, is, is strange. Well, I think you're facing two things. And I think something uh, that the public really does have to get a grapple with and get their heads around is the fact that money laundering at a casino is directly linked to gang violence in Surrey. And you can find the links. You can yeah. actually follow the same name person all along the way. And people need to know that some of those individuals that are getting killed either because uh, they are the targeted victim or an unintended victim. Yeah. Goes back to some of that money laundering. Right. The other problem that we have in BC is we keep saying the police should be doing more. The police should be investigating this. The yeah. police should be investigating that. I was stunned when Stats Canada came out with the number of police officers per 100,000 population yeah. in Canadian communities across Canada. And for the communities yeah. across Canada, that have 100,000 people or more. The city with the fewest RCMP officers, less than 100 per 100,000, is Richmond, BC, the epicenter of money laundering in the province. And given the record, I mean, the RCMP has, and all the bad, bad press you're seeing these days with how they're treating their officers and their female officers, you know, one has to really wonder just what is, how are they associated? It, in the higher up, in the higher echelons of the RCMP, what what's going on there? You know, is this a real political agenda or is it just oversight? Anyway, 
Uh, Dermot, always great to talk to you. It's a great, great pleasure. You put a little bit of meat on the bones of some of these things that we're having so much trouble trying to understand. And I hope we can have you back sometime in the near future. We can continue on with some other thing to talk about that's related here because there's so many other topics to, to follow now that if you think about the, the associations that have been shown today. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Walter. So that wraps up this segment of Citizens Forum. It's easy to vote in PR systems. This is the ballot that we are going to be voting on in October and November to decide whether or not to change our voting system from the first past the post system we use now to a proportional system. So you can see that the ballot has two questions. The first question says, do you want to keep our old system or do you want to change to a proportional system? And the second question, and the second question says, if we change, if we change to a proportional system, which system do you prefer? And there are three choices. There is dual member proportional, there is mixed member proportional, and there is rural-urban proportional. Now, all three systems still give us our own directly elected MLA, as we have now, although there will be fewer directly elected MLAs. So we will still have our own directly elected MLA, and all three systems are very proportional, which means that a party that gets 10% of the vote will get 10% of the seats, and a party that gets 30% of the vote will get 30% of the seats, but nobody will get over 50% of the seats with only 40% of the votes as we get now. So, this is the ballot for dual member proportional. Here it is. Um, it looks fairly simple, and I just want to show you how easy it is to vote. There, it takes about two seconds. And with that, I have voted to elect my own directly elected MLA. And I will also make, and we will also get a proportional system where a party that gets 10% will get 10%, blah, blah, blah. This is the ballot for mixed member proportional. If you have a look, you can see it's a little more complex, but the voting is still very easy. It takes about two seconds. There we go, and there we go, I'm finished. Once again, I've, ere I've elected my own MLA, just as we do now, and we get proportionality. And here is the ballot for the third system called rural-urban proportional. Again, it looks a little more complicated than the first one, but the voting is very easy. There we go, and there we go. It takes two seconds, and I, once again, I directly elect my own MLA, and uh, we get a proportional system. So that's how easy it is to vote with proportional representation. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the Citizens Forum, and this is the Walt and Jack portion of the show in which we look at the current events of the last couple of weeks and try to make some sense out of it. Uh, so welcome, Jack, to the show. Thank you all. Um, we just had a little chat just now, and we were wondering what are the topics we should be covering, and one is we, something we just can't ignore any longer is the smoke that is outside right now. So what do you think is happening? Do you think that our politicians at the legislature are going to start to catch on that maybe we should be, say, winding down the use of fossil fuels that is causing the, the, the climate change, that is causing the forest fires, or are they drawing any connections to that? You know, today is, uh, it's Monday, August 20th. Yeah. So the city is covered in smoke. The whole province is covered in smoke. And it, there is not one media outlet or one politician in the country, I don't think, except here on community television, that is saying that we have to change. I mean, it, yeah. is it not clear and obvious that we have to change? Because this is only the beginning. It's going to get much, much worse. So we have to drive less, we, which, which is, and it's all going to be fine. 
you know, we will end up with a better society and better communities and, and better lives if we do these things. Yeah. But it'll be less corporate profit, and that's why we can't do it. Because they want us driving cars, and they want us burning oil, and they want us whatever. So, I mean, we have to start just consuming less. We have to immediately cancel the Kinder Morgan pipeline. The provincial government has got to say, no, there will be no LNG industry with all the fracking that our NDP government fully supports, 100% the LNG industry. They're just waiting for the companies to say they're going to do it. The government has already given them the go-ahead, and not only the go-ahead, but every tax break you can imagine they're getting. Now, folks may not know about this because the media doesn't want you to know, but it's, it's, it's just waiting for the companies to decide they're going to frack our province, poison our water, poison us, and for what? I mean, it, so that's, that's where we're at. Um, and when I listen to the media, instead of pulling us together to work to solve the problems we all have, the media is going all out to divide us and have us fighting each other. They're just, I mean, they can't get enough of division and anger yeah. because they know what's going on. They just want us fighting each other because the real enemy is the corporation itself and they don't want us to come together to save our own lives because that's basically the point we're at. You know, I. Uh there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, nuances to the story with, uh, with natural gas, and, and John Horgan's always supported liquefied natural gas. So there's nothing new here. And off he went to China soon after he was elected, trying to strike a deal. Um, the big problem is that there's no market for, for natural gas right now because everybody has been developing natural gas all over the world, and, and they have much cheaper, uh, much more easily accessed gas than we have in Canada. Now, we think, okay, natural gas is not as bad as burning oil or something, and there's lots of debate about that. Well, no, well, it is but, as bad but, as burning but if oil. But the, the end use of natural gas seems to burn cleaner than oil. But if you look at the whole development of it, particularly with the frac gas, but the what, um, I'll just mention this article that uh, I read in the Tai, and I'll, I'll just hold it up here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a how uh, the BC's gas industry is supporting the the uh, tar sands development in, in Alberta so here we have a situation where uh, they're they're uh, fracking gas and developing natural gas and thinking it's going to become uh, and people are being poisoned out there oh out yeah in the northeast and people are being poisoned the media will not tell us about it but yeah. it's like uh, it's like Nigeria. I mean, the stories from the people who live out there are unbelievable. Yeah, people turning on their taps and, and lighting, the, lighting, the, uh, lighting the gas on the end of their water tap. The thing is that a good amount of our gas in, the, in British Columbia is not going towards the west or going to China. It's going east to Alberta. And this gas is needed to pump, or not to pump, well, they eventually do pump the bitumen. You need the gas products from natural gas in order to, to enable the, the development of the, of the tar sands. Are, so are those the dilutants? There's dilutants uh, that actually basically make the um, stuff, flow, the stuff through the flow through the pipes more freely. Because that's, that is supposed to be really, really toxic. The dilutants are supposed to be remarkably toxic, even compared Very to Very complex bitumen. chemicals. Uh, but also so just the gas BC. itself is being burnt to heat water to pump into the ground to push uh, the oil and uh, push the tar sands out and things of that nature also in the heavy oil. So uh, we're not being told about that. Uh, Horgan is just talking about developing this new LNG industry and I think it's, it's a little bit of a red herring. I think they, one of the main reasons why they want to develop it is to sell this gas to Alberta so Alberta can push their, their oil, uh, their tar sands oil through pipelines back into British Columbia. So in the end, there's all this opposition that the NDP and Horgan has been saying about uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline and all that. They're, they're enabling this oil and gas development. They're not fighting it really. And I think the, the, what happened with uh, 
the, how the federal government has stepped in and, and bought the pipeline for about 10 times what it's really worth was all planned in advance. It really looks like an orchestrated, just a charade. Now, I'm sure that sounds a bit crazy to a lot of people, but I agree with you 100%. I think the whole thing, the fight between uh, the government of Alberta and the government of BC over where we want to stop yeah. it and no, it's all about jobs, I think that whole thing was faked. It was done deliberately to divide the country, create fear, and create a situation where Justin Trudeau could step in yeah. and, uh, and purchase uh, a pipeline, which if you look at the smoke outside, you know there is no future for, yeah. the, for this pipeline. Because if there's a future for the pipeline, there's no future for us. I mean, that's becoming increasingly evident. Yeah. The whole industry, um, really, it, it's, it's, if it doesn't shut, if we can't shut it down, yeah. It will shut us down. And meanwhile, people are still being arrested in Burnaby That's trying right. to stop the pipeline. People are getting arrested for trying to stop the pipeline. Is everything completely backwards, or what is going on here? Well, it's, 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 it's business as usual. I mean, Stephen Harper and, and Justin Trudeau, I mean, if you think, look at them and think, oh, it's such a big breath of, breath of fresh air to have this young, new politician. But if you actually look at the policies, if you actually look at the activities of the government, it's business as usual. It's just more of a smiling, friendly face yeah, that they're doing exactly. to us. A smiling, friendly face. And just, you know, just one last thing about the Kinder Morgan pipeline. One reason that I don't think the BC government was really opposed to the pipeline was that they never used their best argument. That was never made public. And the best yeah. argument is the Alberta Federation of Labor opposed the Kinder Morgan pipeline because they didn't want the resource pumped out of the country. They want to refine it in Alberta and create jobs there. So the Alberta Federation of Labor opposed the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And our, our government, who is, we all know, very closely tied into the unions, never chooses to never mention that in the whole fight and allows the media, which also knows the truth, to portray us who want to stop the pipeline as the enemy of jobs when in fact, as I said, the unions oppose the pipeline because it's How bad about for the, jobs. How about the Site C dam project? Were the unions not also opposed to that? I, I know there's a lot of international workers uh, that are brought in to do these ma major pro uh, projects. Uh, and these foreign workers do not have the same rights and privileges that Canadian citizens have, and the same protection. Uh, and we see, you know, in, in the case of Site C, foreign corporations uh, doing the building, including um, a Canadian corporation, and uh, the name escapes me, uh, Lavalin, who has a very, very checkered past. To put it mildly. Uh, yeah, to put it mildly. SNC in, Lavalin. Yeah, in other countries. So we, we're not only finding that it's a bad model for, for any, any kind of energy development, but also the people that are actually involved in it have some very unsavory facts about where, what they have done in other countries. And it doesn't seem to be a problem with our government, the new government we have in British Columbia. We, we, would, we all hope to stop... Uh, the Site C dam, uh, anyone that was, uh, was aware of the real true environmental issues. Uh, but the... Uh, and the economic issues. Economic, well. so social, nothing. there's just nothing, there's not, it had nothing going for it. Uh, but we had John Horgan and others standing up in tears, uh, saying that they had to go ahead and do it because it was just going to cost too much not to build the dam when all the experts were saying, no, we had cancel the cancel it. It hasn't been that expensive so far. You know, it's cost us a few billion, but this could get into tens and, and, and $50 billion in debt by the time this project in its lifetime of how much we're going to lose. But they didn't seem to see it that way, and they went ahead with it anyway. So imagine if the NDP took the 8 to $10 billion we still have to spend for this completely insane project, which is going to flood prime farmland at a time when does food supply not look more and more important? Plus, poison the water because the water in the reservoir becomes poisoned with mercury. All the fish are poisoned. You can't eat them, blah, blah, blah. Plus, there's a huge 
greenhouse gas hit. When you build a reservoir, it creates methane, and, and it, 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 it's a huge, everything we've been told about how good reservoirs are is, is a lie like everything else they tell us. But imagine if we took that $8 billion that we're going to spend and put it into housing instead. Yeah. We would solve so many of our problems, create so many jobs. We could build wonderful communities because yeah. we'd have the money to do it. And yet that is not even on the horizon. They have no intention of ever doing anything like that. Because I think the plan is you've got to bankrupt BC Hydro yeah. and bankrupt us so the corporations can go to the bank. You know, this is all a good argument for uh, changing our electoral system in British Columbia and having a more fair system, like some type of proportional representation where more voices are heard in the legislature. And they cannot ram this agenda down our throats when they get these fake, ma false majorities like the NDP would have had if the Greens, uh, the Greens are helping them out in this case. But still, it's not a majority of the, of the voters in this province. Um, but we need a fair voting system. So these things get discussed in a fair way. And, uh, you know, we're, right now it's really a corporate government that we're dealing with. It's, it's all for the corporations. And we seem to get the crumbs that fall off the table and hope we can survive on, in, it, in, the, in the economy. But it's all for the rich at this point. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree 100%. And uh, we're in very tenuous times. I just heard, you know, the stock market keeps going up and up and up. I've just read a couple of articles in the last couple of weeks saying the only reason the stock market is going up is because the corporations have spent in the last six months close to a trillion dollars, which is a record. They've never spent that kind of money in the past to buy back their own stocks. So the corporations are spending all their money. I have a feeling the insiders are selling like crazy, collecting money. The, and when they bring this down, the housing bubble, the stock market bubble, it is going yeah. to be chaos like we cannot even imagine. And I think the corporation, the plan is for them to completely take over the country. Yeah. And Canada and the United States and everything. And just, we're going back to like the times of Robin Hood where, you know, the aristocracy ruled and the rest of us were peasants. I think that's where they want to take. Now, can we stop them? Well, getting a better voting system is a step in the right direction. And we have to treasure democracy. We have to realize it's the only way we're going to ever have a voice. When we don't right now, it's government of the corporation. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty easy to understand. So, Jack, I think we're going to have to wrap up this segment. Uh, I wish we had some better news to report on this week. But... Uh, that cloud that's hanging out outside the door right now and that smoke really should be a reminder to everyone that it's now is the time. We can't take this anymore. Get out and get involved and, and do, not, do not withdraw from, the, uh, from being active in, pol in the political discussion. Get out there, get involved, support proportional representation this fall and maybe we can turn this around. So that completes the segment of Citizens Forum. The voting system that we use in Canada called First Past the Post does not give us the governments that we vote for. So in 2015, Albertans gave the Conservative Party and the Wild Rose Party 52% of their votes. Rachel Notley's NDP in 2015 got only 40.6% of the votes. But the NDP won 54 out of 86 seats and a majority government with the support of only 40.6% of the voters. Albertans really voted for a conservative Wild Rose coalition government with 52% of the vote. But they didn't get that. They got an NDP government instead. So our voting system did not give Albertans what they voted for. In our 2015 federal election, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals got 39.5% of the votes. But our voting system gave them 184 
out of 338 seats. More than 60% of Canadians did not vote Liberal, but Canada got a Liberal majority government. And once again, our voting system didn't give us the government that we voted for. And this year, in 2018, Ontario voted for an NDP Liberal Green coalition government. These three parties got 57% of the votes. But our voting system gave 76 out of 124 seats and a majority government and all the power to Doug Ford and the Conservatives who got only 40.5% of the votes compared to 57% for the other three parties. The people of Ontario also did not get the government they voted for. Our first past the post voting system does not give us the governments we voted for. And this is a very big problem. Proportional voting does give us the governments we voted for. And the question is, why can't we get the governments that we vote for? Thank you. Welcome back. I'd just like to thank our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Uh, my guest in this segment is our director, Will Smith, and Will is worried about eating, and with a good cause. Yeah, so I, I've uh, I started investigating eating bugs, because even, you, everybody can have a garden, but you know it's, it's harder to get your protein without some kind of meat. So um, over at Camosun, they have a program about bugs, and they've got this book, and it's uh, called Edible, and an adventure into the world of eating insects. So I started, re I read that just to see what, what would be good. And I tried some bugs over at Camosun too. So they have so a class like? They yeah, they have a class on it. And, uh, but they had, they had an exposition. The students did different kinds of bugs. So I was going to try the crickets. But the guy told me that crickets are, just think of them as land shrimp. And I'm allergic to shrimp. And they're actually part of, evidently, they're part of the same family. Okay. And so I didn't try the crickets because I might have an allergic reaction. I, I got food poisoning once in Houston in the, when I was traveling. And uh, I can't eat shrimp anymore, or any shellfish for that matter. So I went over to the mealworms, and somebody had prepared a tasty way of doing mealworms. And I, I liked them. And the other thing is I, I, like, um, I like escargot, you know, the snails. And, so, and, they, and what, what they do with escargot is they... Uh, they grow them, feeding them whatever they feed them, and then the last week they feed them, like they feed them wine and some spices, so they get this flavor. And I'm thinking that would be kind of a fun project to see if mealworms could be, you know, you could do sort of the same thing with mealworms. They might turn out to be a, a real delicacy. So if anybody, if anybody is interested in doing that project, I think it would be a good way to turn compost into food. And um, in addition I'm to just garden. hypocritical, you know. Well, I'm, I'm squeamish and hypocritical. I'm just, I just like to eat. And I know that the politicians aren't going uh, to... The, what, what they're doing, to me, a lot of the, what's going on in politics just seems crazy. I, I used to be a uh, conservative Republican when I voted in the United States, and I've just gotten to where I, I can't... I mean, it just seems like Alice in Wonderland to me. You can see, so, folks, there's hope for all of us. So <laughs> I, um, I just wanted to... I, I have a, an idea now... I think proportional representation sounds good. Um, the way I understand the system right now, it's like you, you choose your color when you're you know, about to vote, and you choose the color reporting that you would like to have, because you don't want to hear, you know, if, you're a, if you're a Green Party person, you don't want to hear what a liberal is saying. I mean, it just doesn't work. So you do get to choose your color, and then you elect a candidate, and the candidate gets some new clothes. They get a nice hat, and then they uh, get a little accessory so they, they see a true view of how things work in the world, and then they put on their special glasses, and then they can focus. And then they go to Ottawa, and they come back, or wherever, Washington, and uh, they come back and they show us what they got. Like, I got a pipeline, I got some GMO salmon, I got a dam, and I get to color them. <laughs> so 
Anyway, it's really fun. Well, that is it's a it's a fun such system. Such a sad truth about how things work. It's, That's how I see it. Yes, it could yes. I could be wrong, you know. I you're not wrong. But anyway, so I ran across a couple of other things that I, I wanted to talk about. The the uh, easiest one to I got this uh, paper here somewhere. If I can find it, uh, maybe I've lost it. Well, it's a quote that it's by oh, uh, yes, you have lost Niels it. Bohr. Yeah. And he says, if you haven't been shocked by quantum physics, then you haven't understood quantum physics. So I get the idea. The main thing about quantum physics that, that we all need to understand is that quantum physics really does prove that consciousness is primary and that everything else is a function of consciousness. So everything that exists around us is a product of our consciousness, and that just seems preposterous. But physicists have been trying to disprove this now for a hundred years, and they can't do it. So, so are you saying that this cup does not It doesn't really, really exist, exist the way that we think it exists. The way we, we don't exist in a universe that exists without us, is what it's saying. But it also means that we're unconscious. So I got some more books of, to try to change my consciousness. I got uh, the, most, the, the one that I really like, this is called Mind to Matter, and it's by Dawson Church. Both of these just came out, you know, like in June. The other one is The Quantum Revelation uh, by Paul Levy. Um, just to show you how different this is, as we discover how the universe operates synchronistically, we come to understand that while we have individual local minds, we also participate in universal non-local mind. So these things are kind of difficult for us to Much understand. Much like the tree humans. roots that join the yeah, forest. Yeah, or the, yeah, or the mycelia for a mushroom. You yeah. know, the mushrooms really aren't that's just the fruit. There's this whole big thing underneath the ground that's really. Well, I'm glad whole. to hear that we have some connection with our yeah, we, human beings. Yeah, so, we don't so even really, know about. what we're finding out is that it's preposterous to solve social problems by killing people, which is the way our political system currently works. You just have to kill the right people, and then everything will be fixed, right? So if they're homeless, let them die. Or if they're over there and they're wearing funny hats, then go over there and kill them. Buy some weapons from the United States to make it, you know, clean. But um, anyway, we're finding out that that's really kind of silly because when we do something like that, we're, we're doing it to ourselves. So uh, my wife and I have been watching. We're, we're thinking, how is this, you know, it's confusing. How, is, how can this possibly be true that this is just a function of our consciousness? So we started watching some really odd videos on YouTube about near-death experiences and past life experiences, hypnosis. And uh, we... we uh, found out about this thing called quantum hypnosis healing techniques where these people get healed just by being hypnotized and finding out what they usually regress to a past life and find out there's something that's coming through into this life and so we thought gee that sounds like an interesting thing to do so we found a local guy here oh, okay. and his name's Garnet Schulhauser and here's his book it's called Dancing on a Stamp and uh, this guy's up in Saanich and uh, he used to be a a corporate attorney so he did you know it's just the kind of guy that I'm totally at home with having been in finance and corporate world in the United States I mean he did acquisitions and mergers and leverage buyouts and so you know he's just like somebody that I'd meet looking like this in my suit and tie and talking uh, making a business deal only he had this paranormal experience where a homeless person just completely changed his life around just by talking to this person he realized that there's a whole lot more going on in the world and he started doing astral traveling and all sorts of, you know getting outside of your body so he's a very interesting person but he's not you know you don't walk into his house and there are crystals everywhere and all this other stuff that you might think are you know or associated with uh, people that talk about that kind of thing he's a, been a, a corporate attorney and then he takes you on a five-hour trip where he, you, meet, you talk for an hour or two just with about your life and what you want to find out about, and he has you prepare some questions. And then for two hours, you get hypnotized, and you access this past life. And, you know, you're, you're lying there, and, you know, this, you think, is this a bunch of blue sky, or is this real? I mean, you're, you're awake. You're not really, you're under, but you're, you know you're conscious. But this stuff is coming out, and you see these things. And what did you think? And, yeah, you, so anyway, I thought it was very useful. He records it. And, but these things are the fact that people are accessing some kind of a causal realm where your consciousness 
is capable of healing and capable of changing reality. This is, this is not what we're taught in school, right? And on that note, we're going to end it. Will, that was a very, very interesting exposition of some okay. very interesting ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Canada's first-past-the-post voting system does not treat voters equally. In 2015, Canada elected a Justin Trudeau majority government. In that election, it took about 38,000 Liberal voters to elect one Liberal MP. You can see they got 6.9 million votes and won 184 seats, which means about 38,000 Liberal voters were needed to elect one member of parliament. But it took 57,000 conservative voters to elect one MP, to elect one conservative MP. They got about 5.6 million votes and won 99 seats. So about 57,000 conservative voters to elect one MP. And the NDP needed 78,000 voters to elect one NDP member of parliament. And it took 602,000 Green voters to elect one Green member of Parliament. The Greens got 602,000 votes, but only elected one member of Parliament. You can see that a Liberal voter was worth about 1.5 times as much as a Conservative voter. A Liberal voter was worth twice as much as an NDP voter. And a Liberal voter was worth about 16 times as much as a Green voter. This is a failing of our first-past-the-post voting system. And I think many of us would agree that this kind of system is neither fair nor democratic in this way. If we had used proportional voting in the last federal election, we would have gotten the government we actually voted for. And you can see, if you look at the screen, that based on the number of votes they actually got, the Liberals should have elected 135 members of Parliament, not 184. The Conservatives should have elected 107, not 99. The people who supported the NDP should have 67 members of Parliament, not 44. The Bloc, 16, not 10. And Green voters should have elected 13 MPs, not the one MP our current voting system gave them. And we would have ended up with a coalition government made up of two or more parties that are supported by more than 50% of the voters. And that's the kind of government we should have, a government that represents most of us. That's what proportional representation and proportional voting systems will give us. Thank you very much. Welcome back. This is being filmed on Monday, August the 20th. I'd like to thank again our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff. Um, I'm just going to ask Walter about a couple of things. So you pulled a couple of stories out of the newspaper, and the first one, I think, is about our good friends Monsanto, one of the more evil corporations in the world. Well, on the Monsanto thing, was, uh, we had uh, uh, a jury that decided that Roundup caused cancer. That was basically what they decided, and that's been made by Monsanto, and this is going to open the floodgates to a lot of court cases in the United States. Um, so basically, it's a good sign when the courts are stepping in and finally recognizing the hard scientific evidence. We've all known this for as long as Roundup's been around, <laughs> that it's, it's a very, very harmful to, to health. So it's a good news story. That was in the TC Times columnist on August 11th. Uh, so good to see the courts pulling yeah, something like that says jury off. backs man. What's the, what's the headline? The ban, he, uh, he claimed that Roundup causes cancer. So this, this case has probably been going on for a year. Yeah. It's a case about 
a major corporation basically poisoning all of us. Everybody, I, I think, everybody in this room and everybody who's watching and everybody in the country is probably tainted to some extent with uh, glyphosate, which is the chemical in Roundup. Yeah. Um, it's been known for decades yeah. how dangerous this stuff is. And yet, aside from this one story, yeah. I mean, Monsanto basically got away with it. They're not going to pay, by the way. They're appealing. Yeah. There are four or 5,000 more cases ready to come because that's just the tip of the iceberg of the people who have been poisoned by, by this product. It's everywhere. I mean, they use it like water on our crops. It's, yeah. it's number one. Uh, where was the Times Colonist and the Gold Mail and CTV and CBC for the last year when this, when this court case is... I mean, look at the coverage yeah. they're giving right now to the Manafort, right? The, you know, the Bush uh, former advisor or whatever. It's wall to wall. But when Monsanto does what they've done, and with a full awareness of the federal government and the government of the United States, because they all know about it, there's nothing. Well, I think the thing to remember here is that, of course, the corporate news has always been the same, and they'll continue on the same way. But the good news here is that in the United States, where when democracy and fairness and, and civil society is really uh, deteriorating very rapidly, that the courts are still holding up. And luckily, they're doing that and, and protecting people through these these um, rulings. And I think that gives us a little bit of hope, Jack, that there's still some, something's still functioning in society that's doing what it should. I mean, the other, the other case was um, uh, the U.S. court orders a ban on harmful pesticide and says the, uh, the, the, the Environmental Protection Agency violated the law. And this was in the Times calling this on August 10th also. Uh, again, another good story coming from Washington, and basically, they they just said that that the EPA did not do their job. They did not even look at the science properly, and that this is also another chemical that was very very harmful, particularly to uh, uh, to the fetus and to young children. Just a minute amount of this uh, chemical can cause brain damage. And uh, Dow Chemical, uh, good old Dow Chemical, uh, are, were the guys that are making this. And again, um, we'll see what happens with it. But I, I just think it's good, great to see that the courts are doing something to help protect the, the public health in the United States. Yes. Um, do you want to delve a bit into the Sir John A. Macdonald statue? So they were the government that created the Indian Act that we're still all suffering under. But the problem here is that it's, it's the method in which the decision was made and how they acted caused this, the repercussions. And so the debate now and all, all, the, all, the, you know, the, all this ink that's being wasted on the paper is all about how it was done and not really looking into the real underlying things that we should be talking about. The thing is about this, Jack, is, is um, when you want to co uh, resolve a conflict, you have to extend an understanding to the other person. And I think this is the point, or the other party, and this is what we're seeing now in the world, particularly south of the border. You have the, the Trump crowd and everybody else. They're yelling and screaming, but nobody's listening. And well, who profits from that? of course, is the status quo and the corporations. So we shouldn't fall into that same, same you know, problems here with making these very small decisions about a statue in the, by, in the, by, the, by our city hall. I think that was a mistake that they made. Why not let the debate go on a bit before they decide to take the statue out? You know, I think to do it in the fashion they did was really counterproductive. Um, I, I feel basically the same way. The, the process uh, could have and should have, I think, been better. Um, there is a city council election coming up uh, in, a, in a few months, and I would really like to just somehow see our city government get reconnected to the people of the city. There's That's such right. a disconnect. 
It's, it's a tragedy for all of us. And get on board and want to make some statements about big issues, about what we're dealing with this in, in this province. You know, a statue by the door of the City Hall is not a huge issue compared to these other massive issues we're dealing with, especially particularly with the environment and the issues around crime and, and, and drug addiction and fentanyl. And the city could really, the city government could do a lot of great things on those issues and stand up and take a stand and try to make a difference. And those things would be much more important to us. Thank you, Walt. And Always a pleasure, Jack. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.